Act One of Love and a Bottle by George Farquhar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dedication To the Right Honorable Peregrine, Lord Marquis of Carmarthen, etc. My Lord, being equally a stranger to your lordship and the whole nobility of this kingdom, something of a natural impulse and aspiring motion in my inclinations has prompted me, though I hazard a presumption, to declare my respect. And, be the success how it will, I am vain of nothing in this place but the choice of my patron. I shall be so far thought a judicious author, whose principal business is to design his works in offering to the greatest honor and merit. I cannot hear, my lord, stand accused of any sort of adulation but to myself because compliments due to merit return upon the giver and the only flattery is to myself whilst i attempt your lordship's praise i dare make no essay on your lordship's youthful bravery and courage because such is always guarded with modesty but shall venture to present you some lines on this subject which the world will undoubtedly apply to your lordship courage the highest gift that scorns to bend to mean devices for a sordid end courage an independent spark from heaven's bright throne by which the soul stands raised triumphant high alone great in itself not praises of the crowd above all vice it stoops not to be proud courage the mighty attribute of powers above by which those great in war are great in love the spring of all brave acts is seated here as falsehoods draw their sordid birth from fear the best and noblest part of mankind pay homage to royalty what veneration then is due to those virtues and endowments which even engage the respect of royalty itself in the person of one of the greatest emperors in the world who chose your lordship not only as a companion but a conductor he wasted the fire of such a britain to animate his cold russians and would therefore choose you his leader in war as in travel he knew the fury of the turk could be only stopped by an english nobleman as the power of france was by an english king a sense of this greatness which might deter others animates me to address your lordship resolved that my first muse should take a high and daring flight i aspire to your lordship's protection for this trifle which i must own myself now proud of affording me this opportunity of humbly declaring myself my lord your lordship's most devoted servant g farquhar dramatis personae roebuck an irish gentleman of a wild roving temper newly come to london read by l g pug lovewell his friend sober and modest in love with lucinda read by todd Mockmode, a young squire, come newly from the university, and setting up for a bow. Read by Thomas Peter. Lyric, a poet, read by Jason in Panama. Pamphlet, a bookseller, read by Abai. Rigadoon, a dancing master, read by Son of the Exiles. Nimble wrist, a fencing master read by kurt club servant to mock mode read by trisha g brush servant to love oil read by craig franklin lucinda a lady of considerable fortune read by lian yao lianthi sister to lovewell in love with roebuck and disguised as lucinda's page read by sonia trudge whore to roebuck Read by Linda Olsen Feitak. Widow Bullfinch, Landlady to Mahmoud Lyric and Trudge. Read by T. J. Burns. Pendris, Attendant and Confidant to Lucinda. Read by Jesse Percival. Bailiff Number One. Read by Roger Moline. Bailiff Two. Read by Larry Wilson. Crippled. Read by Alan Mapstone. Porter, read by Owen Cook. Boy, read by Larry Wilson. 
Mask One, read by Nemo. Second Mask, read by Sandra. Servant, read by Eva Davis. Stage Directions, read by Tom Penn. Scene, London. Prologue, by J. H., spoken by Mr. Powell. A servant attending with a bottle of wine. As stubborn atheists, who disdain to pray, repent, though late, upon their dying day, so in their pangs most authors racked with fears implore your mercy in our suppliant prayers. But our new author has no cause maintained. Let him not lose what he has never gained. Love and a bottle are his peaceful arms. Ladies and gallants, have not these some charms? For love, all mankind to the fair must sue, and, sirs, the bottle he presents to you. Health to the play. Drinks. Even let it fairly pass. Sure none sit here that will refuse their glass. Oh, there's a damning soldier. Let me think. He looks as he were sworn to what? To drink. Drinks. Come on, then. Foot to foot be boldly set, and our young author's new commission wet. He and his bottle here attend their doom. From you the poet's helicon must come. If he has any foes to make amends, he gives his service. Drinks. Sure you now are friends. No critic here will he provoke to fight. The day be theirs. He only begs his night. Pray pledge him now, secured from all abuse. Then name the health you love. Let none refuse. But each man's mistress be the poet's muse. Love and a Bottle Act One, Scene One Lincoln's Inn Fields Enter Roebuck repeating the following line. Thus far our arms have with success been crowned. <laughs> Heroically spoken, faith, of a fellow that has not one farthing in his pocket. If I have one penny to buy a halter with all in my present necessity, may I be hanged, though I am reduced to a fair way of obtaining one methodically very soon, if robbery or theft will purchase the gallows. But hold, can't I rob honourably by turning soldier? Enter Cripple begging. One farthing for the poor old soldier. For the Lord's sake. Ah, a glimpse of damnation, just as a man is entering into sin, is no great policy of the devil. But how long did you bear arms, friend? Five years, and please you, sir. And how long has that honourable crutch borne you? Fifteen, sir. Very pretty. Five year a soldier, and fifteen a beggar. This is hell right, an age of damnation for a momentary offence. Thy condition, fellow, is preferable to mine. The merciful bullet, more kind than thy ungrateful country, has given thee adventure in thy broken leg, from which thou canst draw a more plentiful maintenance than I from all my limbs in perfection. Prithee, friend, why wouldst thou beg of me? Dost think I am rich? No, sir, and therefore I believe you charitable. Your warm fellows are so far above the sense of our misery that they can't pity us, and I have always found it by sad experience as needless to beg of a rich man as of a clergyman. Our greatest benefactors, the brave officers, are all disbanded, and must now turn beggars like myself. And so, times are very hard, sir. What? Are the soldiers more charitable than the clergy? Aye, sir. A captain will say, damn me, and give me sixpence. And a parson shall whine out, God bless me, and give me not a farthing. Now I think the officer's blessing much the best. 
Are the bow never compassionate? The great four wigs they wear stop their ears so close that they can't hear us. And if they should, they never have any farthings about them. Then I am a bow, friend. Therefore, pray leave me. Begging from a generous soul that has not to bestow is more tormenting than robbery to a miser in his abundance. Prithee, friend, be thou charitable for once. I beg only the favour which rich friends bestow. A little advice. I am as poor as thou art, and am designing to turn soldier. No, no, sir. See what an honourable post I'm forced to stand to. My rags are scarecrows sufficient to frighten any one from the field. Rather turn bird of prey at home. Showing his crutch. Grum mercy, O oh, devil. I find hell has its pimps of the poorer sort, as well as those of the wealthy. I fancy, friend, thou hast got a cloven foot instead of a broken leg. "'Tis a hard case that a man must never expect to go nearer heaven "'than some steps of a ladder, but tis unavoidable. "'I have my wants to lead and the devil to drive, "'and if I can't meet my friend Lovewell, "'which I think impossible, being so great a stranger in town, "'fortune, thou hast done thy worst. "'I proclaim open war against thee. "'I'll stab thy next rich darling that I see.' and killing him be thus revenged on thee retires to the back part of the stage as into the walks making some turns across the stage in disorder exit cripple enter lucinda and pendrus oh these summer mornings are so delicately fine pendrus it does me good to be abroad ay madam these summer mornings are as pleasant to young folks as the winter nights to married people or as your morning of beauty to Mr. Lovewell. I'm violently afraid the evening of my beauty will fall to his share very soon, for I am inclinable to marry him. I shall soon lie under an eclipse, Pindress. Then it must be full moon with your ladyship, but why would you choose to marry in summer, madam? I know no cause, but that people are apt to run mad in hot weather, unless you take a woman's reason. What's that, madam? Why, I am weary of lying alone. Oh, dear madam, lying alone is very dangerous. Tis apt to breed strange dreams. I had the oddest dream last night of my courtier that is to be, Squire Mockmode. He appeared crowded about with the dancing master, pushing master, music master, and all the throng of bow makers. And methought he had mimicked foppery so awkwardly that his imitation was downright burlesquing it. I burst out a laughing so heartily that I wakened myself. But dreams go by contraries, madam. Have you not seen him yet? No. But my uncle's letter gives account that he's newly come to town from the university, where his education could reach no farther than to guzzle fat ale, smoke tobacco, and chop logic. Phew! It makes me sick. But he's very rich, madam. His concerns join to yours in the country. I... But his concern shall never join to mine in the city. For since I had the disposal of my own fortune, Lovewell is the man for my money. Aye, and for my money, for I have had above twenty pieces from him since his courtship began. He is the prettiest, sober gentleman, and I have so strong an opinion of his modesty that I am afraid, madam, your first child will be a fool. Oh, God forbid! I hope a lawyer understands business better than to beget anything non compos The walks fill apace. The enemy approaches. We must set out our false colours. Put on their masks. We masks are the purest privateers. Madam, how would you like to cruise about a little? Well enough. Had we no enemy but our fops and sits. But I dread these blustering men of war. The officers who, after a broadside of dams and sinkmes, are for boarding all masks they meet as lawful prize. In truth, madam, and most of them are lawful prize, for they generally have French wear under hatches. Oh, hideous! Oh, my conscience, girl, 
thou art quite spoiled an actress upon the stage would blush at such expressions ay madam and your ladyship would seem to blush in the box when the redness of your face proceeded from nothing but the constraint of holding your laughter did you chide me for not putting a stronger lace in your stays when you had broke one as strong as a hempen cord with containing a violent tee at a smutty jest in the last play go go thou art a naughty girl thy impertinent chat has diverted us from our business i am afraid lovewell has missed us for want of the sign but whom have we here an odd figure some gentleman in disguise i believe had he a finer suit on i should believe him in disguise for i fancy his friends have only known him by that this twelve month his mien and air show him a gentleman and his clothes demonstrate him a wit he may afford us some sport i have a female inclination to talk to him hold madam he looks as like one of those dangerous men of war you just now mentioned as can be you had best send out your pinnace before to discover the enemy no i'll hail him myself moves towards roebuck what sir dreaming slaps him on the shoulder with her fan roebuck sullenly yes madam of what of the devil and now my dream's out what do you dream standing yes faith lady very often when my sleep's haunted by such pretty goblins as you you're a sort of dream i would fain be reading i'm a very good interpreter indeed madam are you then one of the wise men of the east no madam but one of the fools of the west pray what do you mean by that an irishman madam at your service oh horrible an irishman a mere wolf-dog i protest been surprised child the wolf-dog is as well-natured an animal as any of your country bulldogs and a much more fawning creature let me tell ye lays hold of her pray good caesar keep off your paws no scraping acquaintance for heaven's sake tell us some news of your country i have heard the strangest stories that the people wear horns and hoofs yes faith a great many wear horns but we had that among other laudable fashions from london i think it came over with your mode of wearing high top knots for ever since the men and the wives bear their heads exalted alike they were both fashions that took wonderfully then you have ladies among you yes yes we have ladies and whores colleges and playhouses churches and taverns fine houses and bawdy houses in short everything that you can boast of but fops poets toads and adders but have you no beau at all yes you come over like the woodcocks once a year and have your ladies no springes to cash them in no madam our own country affords as much better wildfowl but they are generally stripped of their feathers by the playhouse and taverns in both which they pretend to be critics and our ignorant nation imagines a full wig as infallible a token of a wit as the laurel oh lord and here tis the certain sign of a blockhead but why no poets in ireland sir faith madam i know not unless st patrick sent them a packing with the other venomous creatures out of ireland nothing that carries a sting in its tongue can live there but since i have described my country let me know a little of england by sight of your face come you to particulars first pray sir unmask by telling who you are and then i'll unmask and show who i am you must distinguish your attendance then madam for the distinguishing particular of me is a secret sir i can keep a secret as well as my mistress and the greater the secrets are i love em the better can't they be whispered sir oh yes madam i can give you a hint by which you may understand em pretends to whisper and kisses her sir you're impudent nay madam since you are so good at minding folks 
have with you catches her fast carrying her off help 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 enter lovewell brush following villain unhand the lady and defend thyself draws what no adherence in this country no has the devil very opportunely set me a throat to quit pray heaven his pockets be well lined quits lucinda who goes off with pendrus have at thee st george for england they fight after some passes roebuck starts back and pauses ha huh. my friend lovewell my dear roebuck fling down their swords and embrace shall i believe my eyes you may believe your ears tis i by god why thy being in london is such a mystery that i must have the evidence of more senses than one to confirm me of its truth but pray unfold the riddle why faith tis a riddle you wonder at it before the explanation then wonder more at yourself for not guessing it what is the universal cause of the continued evils of mankind the universal cause of our continued evil is the devil sure no tis the flesh ned that very woman that drove us all out of paradise has sent me a packing out of ireland how so only tasting the forbidden fruit that was all is simple fornication become so great a crime there as to be punishable by no less than banishment egad mine was double fornication ned the jade was so pregnant to bear twins the fruit grew in clusters and my unconscionable father because i was a rogue in debauching her would make me a fool by wedding her but i would not marry a whore and he would not own a disobedient son and so but was she a gentlewoman Psha! no she had no fortune she wore indeed a silk manteau and high head but these are grown as little signs of gentility nowadays as that is of chastity but what necessity forced you to leave the kingdom i will tell you to shun the insulting authority of an incensed father the dull and often repeated advice of impertinent relations the continual clamours of a furious woman and the shrill bawling of an ill-natured bastard from all which good lord deliver me and so you left them to granddada <laughs> heaven was pleased to lessen my affliction by taking away the she-brat but the tether is i hope well because a brave boy whom i christened edward after thee love well i made bold to make my man stand for you and your sister sent her maid to give her a name to my daughter now you talk of my sister pray how does she dear love will a very miracle of beauty and goodness but i don't like her why she's virtuous and i think beauty and virtue are as ill-joined as lewdness and ugliness but i hope your arguments could not make her a proselyte to this profession faith i endeavoured it but that plaguy honour damn it for a whim were it as honourable for women to be whores as men to be her masters we should have lewdness as great a mark of quality among the ladies as tis now among the lords what do you hold no innate principle of virtue in women we hold an innate principle of love in them their passions are as great as ours their reason weaker we admire them and consequently they must us and i beg to tell thee once more that had women no safeguard but your innate principle of virtue honest george roebuck would have lain with your sister ned and should enjoy a countess before night but methinks george twas not fair to tempt my sister methinks twas not fair of thy sister ned to tempt me as she was thy sister i had no design upon her but as she's a pretty woman i could scarcely forbear her were she my own but upon serious reflection could not you have lived better at home by turning thy whore into a wife than here by turning other men's wives into whores there are merchant ladies in london and you must trade with them for aught i see ay but is the trade open 
is the manufacture encouraged old boy oh wonderfully a great many poor people live by it though the husbands are for engrossing the trade the wives are altogether for encouraging interlopers but i hope you have brought some small stock to set up with robach aside the greatness of my wants which would force me to discover em makes me blush to own em aloud why faith ned i had a great journey from ireland hither and would burden myself with no more than just necessary charges oh then you have brought bills no faith exchange of money from dublin hither is so unreasonable high that what that thunes i have not one farthing no you understand me no faith i never understand one that comes in forma pauperis i haven't studied the law so long for nothing but what prospect can you propose of a supply i'll tell you when you appeared i was just thanking my stars for sending me a throat to cut and consequently a purse but my knowledge of you prevented me of that way and therefore i think you're obliged in return to assist me by some better means you were once an honest fellow but so long study in the ends may alter a man strangely as you say no dear roebuck i'm still a friend to thy virtues and esteem thy follies as foils only to set them off i did but rally you and to convince you here are some pieces share of what i have about me take them as earnest of my father's supply you know my estate sufficient to maintain us both if you will either restrain your extravagancies or i retrench my necessaries the profession of kindness is so great that i could almost suspect it of design but come friend i am heartily tired with the fatigue of my journey besides a violent fit of sickness which detained me a month at coventry to the exhausting my health and money let me only recruit by a relish of the town in love and a bottle and then as they are going off roebuck starts back surprised oh heavens and earth what's the matter man why death and the devil oh what's worse a woman and a child owns don't you see mrs trudge with my bastard in her arms crossing the field towards us oh the indefatigable whore to follow me all the way to london mrs trudge my old acquaintance ay ay the very same your old acquaintance and for aught i know you might have clubbed about getting the brats tis but reasonable then i should pay share at the reckoning i'll help to provide for her in the meantime you had best retire brush conduct this gentleman to my lodgings and run from thence to widow bullfinch's and provide a lodging with her for a friend of mine fly and come back presently Exeunt Roebuck and Brush. So my friend comes to town like the great Turk to the field, attended by his concubines and children, and I'm afraid these are but parts of his retinue. But hold, I shan't be able to sustain the shock of this woman's fury. I'll withdraw till she has discharged her first volley, then surprise her. Retires behind. Enter Trudge with child crying. Hush, hush, hush and indeed it was a young traveller and what would it say it says that daddy is a false man a cruel man and an ungrateful man in troth so he is my dear child what shall i do with it poor creature hush 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 was ever poor woman in such a lamentable condition immediately after the pains of one travail to undergo the fatigues of another but i'm sure he can never do well for though i can't find him my curses and the misery of this babe will certainly reach him lovewell coming forward methinks i should know that voice what mrs trudge and in london whose brave boy hast thou got there oh lord mr lovewell i'm very glad to see you and yet i'm ashamed to see you but indeed he promised to marry me 
and you know mr lovewell that he's such a handsome man and has so many ways of insinuating that the frailty of women's nature could not resist him what's all this a handsome man ways of insinuating frailty of nature i don't understand these ambiguous terms ah mr lovewell i'm sure you have seen mr roebuck and i'm sure twould be the first thing he would tell you i'll refer it to you mr lovewell if he is not an ungrateful man to deal so barbarously with any woman that had used him so civilly i was kinder to him than i would have been to me own born brother oh then i find kissing goes by favour mrs trudge faith you're all alike you men are all alike poor child he's as like his own dad as if he were spit out of his mouth see mr lovewell if he has not mr roebuck's nose to a hair and you know he has a very good nose and the little pig's knee has mamma's mouth oh the little lips and tis the best-natured little dear <laughs> snuggles and kisses it and would it ask its godfather blessing indeed mr lovewell i believe the child knows you <laughs> well i will give it my blessing gives it gold re-enter lucinda and pendrus who seeing the others instantly abscond come madam i'll first settle you in a lodging and then find the false man as you call him exit with trudge lucinda coming forward the false man is found already was there ever such a lucky discovery my care for his preservation brought me back and now behold how my kindness is returned their fighting was a downright trick to frighten me from the place thereby to afford him opportunity of entertaining his whore and brat your conjecture madam bears a colour for looking back i could perceive him talking very familiarly so that they could not be strangers as their pretended quarrel would intimate tis all true as he is false what slighted despised my honourable love trucked for a whore o oh, villain epitome of thy sex but i'll be revenged i'll marry the first man that asks me the question nay though he be a disbanded soldier or a poor poet or a senseless fop nay though impotent i'll marry him oh madam that's to be revenged on yourself i care not fool i deserve punishment for my credulity as much as he for his falsehood and you deserve it too minx your persuasions drew me to this assignation i never loved the false man pendrus aside that's false i'm sure but you thought to get another piece of gold we shall have him giving you money on the same score he was so liberal to his whore just now walks about in a passion re-enter lovewell brush following so much for friendship now for my love i haven't transgressed much oh there she is oh my angel runs to lucinda oh thou devil starts back not unless you damn me madam you're damned already you're a man exit pushing pendrus you're a woman i'll be sworn hey day what giddy female planet rules now by the lord these women are like their maidenheads no sooner found than lost here brush run after pendrus and know the occasion of this stay come back soons i'm a fool that's the first wise word you have spoken these two months trouble me with your untimely jest sirrah and i'll your pardon sir i'm in downright earnest aside tis less slavery to be apprenticed to a famous clap surgeon than to a lover he falls out with me because he can't fall in with his mistress i can bear it no longer sirrah what are you mumbling a short prayer before i depart sir i have been these three years your servant but now sir i'm your humble servant bows as going hold you shan't leave me sir 
you can't be my master why so because you're not your own master yet one would think you might for you have lost your mistress oon sir let her go and a fair riddance who throws away a tester and a mistress loses sixpence that little pimping cupid is a blind gunner had he shot as many darts as i have carried billet's dough he would have laid her kicking with her heels up here now in short sir my patience is worn to the stumps with attending my shoes and stockings are upon their last legs with trudging between you i have sweat out all my moisture of my hand with palming your clammy letters upon her i have hold sir your trouble is now at an end for i design to marry her and have you courted her these three years for nothing but a wife do you think rascal i would have taken so much pains to make her a miss no sir the tenth part on't would have done but if you are resolved to marry god be we what's the matter now sirrah why the matter will be that i must then pimp for her hark ye sir what have you been doing all this while but teaching her the way to cuckold ye take care sir look before ye leap you have a ticklish point to manage can ye tell sir what's her quarrel to you now i can't imagine i don't remember that ever i offended her that's it sir she resolves to put your easiness to the test now that she may with more security rely upon it hereafter always suspect those women of designs that are for searching into the humours of their courtiers for they certainly intend to try them when they're married how camest thou such an engineer in love i have sprung some minds in my time sir and since i have trudged so long about your amorous messages i have more intrigue in the sole of my feet than some blockheads in their whole body sirrah have you ever discovered any behaviour in this lady to occasion this suspicious discourse sir has this lady ever discovered any behaviour of yours to occasion this suspicious quarrel i believe the lady has as much of the innate principle of virtue as the gentleman said as any woman but that baggage her attendant is about ravishing her lady's page every hour tis an old saying like master like man why not as well like mistress like maid lovewell aside since thou art for trying humours have with you madam lucinda besides so fair an opportunity offers that faith seemed to design it aloud have you left the gentleman at my lodgings yes sir and sent a porter to his inn to bring his things thither that's right love like other diseases must sometimes have a desperate cure the school of venus imposes the strict discipline and awful cupid is a chastening god he whips severely no not if we kiss the rod exeunt end of act one act two of love and a bottle by george farquhar this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One Lovewell's Lodgings. Enter Lovewell, Roebuck, and Brush. Oh, my conscience! The fawning creature loves you! Hey, the constant effects of debauchery a woman are that she infallibly loves the man for doing the business and he certainly hates her but what company is she like to have with this same widow's brush oh the best of company sir a poet lives there sir they are the worst company for they're ill-natured ay sir but it does nobody any harm for these fellows that get bred by their wits are always forced to eat their words they must be good-natured spite of their teeth sir tis said he pays his lodgings by cracking some smutty jests with his landlady overnight for she's very well pleased with his natural parts while roebuck and brush converse together lovewell seems to project something by himself what other lodgers are there one newly entered a young squire just come from the university a mere peripatetic i warrant him 
a very pretty family a heathen philosopher an english poet and an irish horror had the landlady but a highland piper to join with them she might set up for a collection of monsters anybody within slaps lovewell on the shoulder yes you are my friend all my thoughts were employed about you in short i have one request to make that you would renounce your loose wild courses and lead a sober life as i do that i will if you grant me a boon you shall have it be it what it will that you would relinquish your precise sober behaviour and live like a gentleman as i do that i can't grant then we're off though should your women prove no better than your wine my debaucheries will foreshorter themselves for want of temptation our women are worse than our wine our claret has but a little of the french in it but our wenches have the devil and all they are both adulterated to prevent the inconveniences of which i'll provide you an honourable mistress an honourable mistress what's that a virtuous lady whom you must love and court the surest method of reclaiming you as thus those superfluous pieces you throw away in wine may be laid out to the poor no no in sweet powder cravats garters snuff-boxes ribbons coach hire and chair hire those idle hours which you misspend with lewd sophisticated wenches must be dedicated to the church no to the innocent and charming conversation of your virtuous mistress by which means the two most exorbitant debaucheries drinking and whoring will be retrenched oh, a very fine retrenchment truly i must first despise the honest jolly conversation at the tavern for the foppish affected dull insipid entertainment at the chocolate house must quit my freedom with ingenious company to harness myself to foppery among the fluttering crowd at cooper's livery boys the second article is that i must resign the company of lewd women for that of my innocent mistress that is i must change my easy natural sin of wenching to that constrained debauchery of lying and swearing the many lies and oaths that i made to thy sister will go nearer to damn me than if i had enjoyed her a hundred times over oh roebuck your reason will maintain the contrary when you're in love that is when i have lost my reason come come a wench a wench a soft white easy consenting creature prithee ned leave mustiness and show me the varieties of the town a wench is the least variety look out see what a numerous train trip along the street there pointing outwards oh venus oh these fine stately creatures very well ned runs out lovell catches him and pulls him back prithee let me go tis a deed of charity i am quite starved oh just take a snap and be with you in the twinkling as you are my friend we must go then we must break for ever quits him he that will leave his friend for a whore i reckon a commoner in friendship as in love if you saw how ill that serious feast becomes a fellow of your years you would never wear it again youth is taking in any masquerade but gravity though lewdness suits much worse with your circumstances sir roebuck aside ay these circumstances damned these circumstances there he has hamstringed me this poverty how it makes a man sneak aloud well prithee let's know this devilish virtuous lady by the circumstances of my body i shall soon be off or on with her know then for thy utter condemnation that she's a lady of eighteen beautiful witty and nicely virtuous a lady of eighteen good beautiful better witty best of all no with these three qualifications if she be nicely virtuous then i'll henceforth adore everything that wears a petticoat witty and virtuous <laughs> why it is as inconsistent in ladies as gentlemen and were i to debauch one for a wager her wit would be my board 
Come, come, the forbidden fruit was plucked from the tree of knowledge, boy. Right. But there was a cunninger devil than you to tempt. I'll assure you, George, your rhetoric would fail you here. She would worst you at your own weapons. Aye, or any man in England, if she be eighteen, as you say. Have a care, man. This satire will get you torn in pieces by the females. You'll fall into Orpheus's fate. Orpheus was a blockhead and deserved his fate. Why? Because he went to hell for a wife. Lovewell, aside. This happens right. Aloud. But you shall go to heaven for a mistress. You shall court this divine creature. I don't desire you to fall in love with her. I don't intend you should marry her neither. But you must be convinced of the chastity of the sex. Though if you should conquer her, the spoil, you rogue, will be glorious and infinitely worth the pains in attaining. Ay, but, Ned, my circumstances, my circumstances. Come, you shan't want money. Then I dare attempt it. Money is the sinews of love as of war. Gad, friend, thou art the bravest pimp I ever heard of. Well, give me directions to sail by, the name of my port. Lead me, Pockets, and end for the keep of good hope. You need no directions as to the manner of courtship. No. I have seen some few principles on which my courtship's founded, which seldom fail, to let a lady rely on my modesty, but to depend myself altogether upon my impudence, to use a mistress like a deity in public, but like a woman in private, to be as cautious then of asking an impertinent question as afterwards of telling a story. Remembering that the tongue is the only member that can hurt a lady's honour, though touched in the tenderest part. Oh, but to a friend, George, you'll tell a friend your success? No, not to her very self. It must be as private as devotion. No blubbing, unless a squaring brat peeps out to tell tales. But where lies my course? Brush shall show you the house. The lady's name is Lucinda. Her mother and father dead, she's heiress to twelve hundred a year. But above all, observe this. She has a page which you must get on your side. Tis a very pretty boy. I presented him to the lady about a fortnight ago. He's your countryman, too. He brought me a letter from my sister, which I have about me. Here, you may read it. Roebuck, aside. Aye, tis her hand. I know it well, and I almost blush to see it reads dear brother a lady of my acquaintance lately dying begged me as her last request to provide for this boy who was her page i hope i have obeyed my friend's last command and obliged a brother by sending him to you pray dispose of him as much as you can for his advantage all friends are well and i am your affectionate sister leanthe while he reads, Lovewell converses in dumb show with Brush. All friends are well. Is that all? Not a word of poor Roebuck? I wonder she mentioned nothing of my misfortunes to her brother. But she has forgot me already. True woman still. Well, I may excuse her, for I am making all the haste I can to forget her. Lovewell, aside to Brush. Be sure you have an eye upon him, and come to me presently at Widow Bullfinch's. Well, George, you won't communicate your success? You may guess what you please. I'm as merry after a mistress as after a bottle. All air, brimful of joy, like a bumper of claret, smiling and sparkling. Then you'll certainly run over. No, no, nor shall I drink to anybody. Exeunt severally. Scene two, a room in Widow Bullfinch's house, a flute and music book upon the table, a case of toys hanging up. Enter Rigadoon, leading in mock mode by both hands. He sings, and mock mode dances awkwardly. Club follows. Cow, dow, de row, one, two. Cow, dow, de row, coupe. Cow, dow, de row, very well. 
Pow, pow, de row. Wrong. Pow, pow, de row. Toes out. Pow, pow, de row. Observe time. Very well, sir. You shall dance as well as any man in England. You have an excellent disposition in your limbs, sir. Observe me, sir. Dance is a new minuet. At every cut, Club makes an awkward imitation by leaping up. And so forth, sir. I'm afraid we shall disturb my landlady. Landlady? Oh, you must have a care of that. She'll never pardon you, landlady. Every woman from a countess to a kitchen wench is madame, and every man from a lord to a lackey, sir. Must I then lose my title of squire? Squire Mockmode? By all means, sir. Squire and Phil were the same thing here. <laughs> That's very comical, Faith. But is there an act of parliament for that, Mr. Rigadoon? Well, since I can't be a squire, I'll do as well. I have a great estate, and want only to be a great beau to qualify me either for a knight or a lord. By the universe, I have a great mind to bind myself prentice to a beau. Could I but dance well, push well, play upon the flute, and swear the most modish oaths, I would set up for quality with every young nobleman of them all. Pray, what are the most fashionable oaths in town? Zunes, I take it, is a very becoming one. Zunes is only used by disbanded officers and bullies, but Zounds is the bow pronunciation. Zounds? Zounds. Yes, sir, we swear as we dance, smooth and with a cadence. Zounds. Tis harmonious and pleases the ladies because tis soft. Zounds, madame, is the only compliment our great beau pass on a lady. But suppose the lady speaks to me, what must I say? Nothing, sir. You must take snush, grin, and make her an humble cringe. Thus. Bows foppishly and takes snush. Mockmo imitates him awkwardly and taking snush, sneezes. Oh, Lord, sir, you must never sneeze. Tis as unbecoming after orangerie as grace after meat. I thought people took it to clear the brain. The bow have no brains at all, sir. Their skull is a perfect snush box. And I heard a physician swear who opened one of them that the three divisions of his head were filled with orangery, bergamot, and plain Spanish. Sounds! I must sneeze! Oh! Oh, bless me! Oh, fie, Mr. Mockmode! What a rustical expression that is! Bless me! You should upon all occasions cry, damn me! You would be as nauseous to the ladies as one of the old patriarchs, if you used that obsolete expression. Club aside. I find that going to the devil is very modish in this town. Aloud. Pray, Master Dancing Master, what religion may these bows be of? A sort of Indians in their religion. They worship the first thing they see in the morning. What's that, sir? Their own shadows in the glass, and some of them such Ellish faces as might frighten them into devotion. Then they are Indians, right, for they worship the devil. Then you shall be as great a bow as any of them, but you must be sure to mind your dancing. Is uh, not music very convenient, too? I can play the bells and maiden fair already. Alamir, Bifabemi, Gesulfa, Delasol, Ella, Efo, Gesurut. I have them all by heart already, but I have been plaguily puzzled about the etymology of these notes, and certainly a man cannot arrive at any perfection unless he understands the derivation of the terms. Oh, Lord, sir, that's easy. Effaults and Gesellreut were two famous German musicians, and the rest were Italians. But why are they only seven? From a prodigious great bass viol with seven strings, 
that played a jig called the music of the spheres the seven planets were nothing but fiddle strings then your stars have made you a dancing master oh lord sir pythagoras was a dancing master he showed the creation to be a country dance where after some antic changes all the parts fell into their places and there they stand ready till the next squeak of a philosopher's fiddle sets em dancing again sir here comes the pushing master then i'll be gone but you must have a care of pushing sir will spoil the niceness of your steps learn a flourish or two and that's all a bow can have occasion for exit enter nimble wrist oh mr nimble wrist i crave you ten thousand pardons by the universe that was a home thrust good sir i hope you're for a breathing this morning takes down a foil i'll assure you mr mock mode you will make an excellent swordsman you're as well shaped for fencing as any man in europe the duke of burgundy is just of your make he pushes the finest of any man in france sa sa like lightning i'm much in love with fencing but i think back sword is the best play oh lard sir have you ever been in france sir no sir but i understand the geography of it france is bounded on the north with the rhine no sir a frenchman is bounded on the north with court on the south with tierce and so forth tis a noble art sir and every one that wears a sword is obliged by his tenure to learn the rules of honour are engraved on my hilt and my blade must maintain em my sword's my herald and the bloody hand my coat of arms and how long have you professed this noble art sir truly sir i served an apprenticeship to this trade sir what are you a corporation then yes sir the surgeons have taken us into theirs because we make so much work for em but as i was telling you sir i professed the science till the wars broke out but then when everybody got commissions i put in for one served the campaigns in flanders and when the peace broke out was disbanded so among a great many other poor rogues am forced to be take to my old trade now the public quarrels ended i live by private ones i still live by dying as the song goes sir while we have english courages french honour and spanish blades among us i shall live sir surely your sword and skill to the king great service abroad yes sir i killed above fifteen of our own officers by private duels in the camp sir killed em fairly killed em thus sir sa 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 perry 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 pushes mock mode on the ribs he strikes nimble wrist over the head and breaks the foil what's the name of that thrust pray sir oh lard sir he did not touch me not in the least sir the foil was cracked a palpable crack blood runs down his face a very palpable crack truly your skull is only cracked palpably cracked that's all well sir if you please to teach me my honours my dancing master has forbidden me any more lest i should discompose my steps your dancing master is a blockhead sir re-enter rigadoon i forgot my gloves and so oh sir he calls you blockhead by the universe zounds sir zounds sir i have more wit in the sole of my foot than you have in your whole body ay sir you capers dance all your brains into your heels which makes you carry such empty noddles your rationals reversed carrying your understanding in your legs your wit is the perfect antipodes to other men's and what are you good monsieur sa sa stand upon your guard mr mockmode he's the greatest falsifier in his art you'll fill your head so full of french principles of honour that you won't have one of honesty left his breastplate there he calls the buff of honour at which all the fools in the kingdom shoot 
and not one can hit the target you talk of robin hood who never shot in his bow sir you dancers are the battle doors of the nation that toss the light foppish shuttlecocks to and again to get yourselves in heat have a care mr mockmode this fellow will make a mere grasshopper of you sir you're the grand pimp to foppery and lewdness and the devil and dancing master dance a caranto over the whole kingdom a pimp sir what then sir i engage couples into the bed of love but you match them in the bed of honour we only juggle people out of their chastity but you cheat them out of their lives oh we shall have you mr mockmo grinning in the bed of honour as if you laughed at the fool who must be hanged for you which is best mr nimblerist an easy minuet or a tyburn jig don't provoke my sword sir lest that art you so revile should revenge itself for every one of you that live by dancing should die by pushing sir and every man that lives by pushing should die dancing i take it zoon sir what do you mean nothing sir tal tal de rao dances this takes the ladies mr mockmo this runs away with all the great fortunes in town though you be a fool a fop a coward dance well and you captivate the ladies the moving a man's limbs pliantly does the business if you want a fortune come to me tal tal de rao dances no no to me sir sa sa does your business soonest with a woman a clean and manly extension of all your parts ha carrying a true point is the matter sa 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 defend yourself pushes at rigadoon who dances and sings retiring off the stage enter widow bullfinch oh goodness what are rooms here could not these fellows wipe their feet before they came up and here's such a tripping and such a stomping that they have broke down all the ceiling you dancing and fancy masters have been the downfall of many houses get out of my doors my house was never in such a pickle you country gentlemen newly come to london like your own spaniels out of a pond must be shaking the water off and bespatter everybody about you Mockmode, having taken snush offering to sneeze sneezes in her face so's madam <laughs> oh bless me den me i mean widow bullfinch aside he is tainted these cursed flies have blown upon him already sa sa defend flanconard madam ah mr mockmode my pushing and dancing days are done but i had a son mr mockmode that would match you ah my poor robin he died of an apoplexy he was as pretty a young man as ever stepped in a black leather shoe he was as like you mr mockmode as one egg is like another he died like an angel but i'm sure he might have recovered but for the physicians oh these doctors these doctors blessed doctors i say for i believe they killed my honest old father ay that is true if my robin had left me an estate i should have said so too <laughs> zounds madam you must not be melancholy madam <laughs> well sir i hope you'll give us the beverage of your fine clothes i'll assure you sir they fit you very well and i like your fancy mightily ay ay madam but what's most modish for beverage for i suppose the fashion of that alters always for the clothes the tailors are the best judges of that but champagne i suppose is champagne a tailor mm, now methinks that were a fitter name for a wig-maker 
I think they call my wig a campaign. You're clear out, sir, clear out. Champagne is a fine liquor, which all your great beaux drink to make em witty. Witty? Oh, by the universe, I must be witty. I'll drink nothing else. I never was witty in all my life. I love jokes dearly. Here, club, bring us a bottle of what you call it, uh, the witty liquor. Exit club. But I thought all you that were bred at university should be wits naturally. The quite contrary, madam. There's no such thing there. We dare not have wit there for fear of being counted rakes. Your solid philosophy is all read there, which is clear another thing. But now I will be a wit by the universe. I must get acquainted with the great poets. Landlady, you must introduce me. Oh, dear me, sir. Would you ruin me? I introduce you? No widow dare be seen with a poet for fear she should be thought to keep him. Keep him? Uh, what's that? They keep nothing but sheep in the country. I hope they don't fleece the wits. Alas, sir, they have no fleeces. There's a great cry, but little wool. However, if you would be acquainted with the poets, I can prevail with a gentleman of my acquaintance to introduce you. "'Tis one Lovewell, a fine gentleman that comes here sometimes. "'Lovewell? By the universe, my rival. I heard of him in the country. Well, "'This puts me in mind of my mistress. Zounds, I'm certainly become a beau already, for I was so in love with myself I quite forgot her. "'I have a note in my pocket-book to find her out by.' "'Pulls out a large pocket-book, turning over the leaves.' reads to himself sixpence for washing tuppence to the maid sixpence for snush one shilling for buttered ale by the universe i have lost the directions hark ye madam does the same love well come often here say you yes sir very often there's a lady of his acquaintance a lodger in the house just now a lady of his acquaintance a lodger in the house just now? Of his acquaintance, do you say? Yes, and a pretty lady, too. And it comes often here, you say? Oh, by the universe, should I happen to lodge in the same house with my mistress? Egad, it must be the same. Can you tell the woman's name? Stay, is her name Lucinda? Perhaps it may, sir. But I believe she's a widow, for she has a young son, and I'm sure tis legitimately begotten, for tis the bravest child you shall see in a summer's day. Tis not like one of our puling brats or the town here, born with the diseases of half a dozen fathers about it. By the universe, I don't remember whether my mistress is maid or widow. But a widow, so much the better, for all your London widows are devilish rich, they say. She came in a coach, did she not, madam? Yes, sir, yes. Then tis infallibly she. Does she not always go out in a coach? She has not stirred abroad since she came, sir. Oh, uh, I was told she was very reserved, though tis very much of a widow. I have often heard my mother say that sitting at home and silence were very becoming in a maid— and she has often chid my sister Dorothy for gadding out to the meadows and tumbling among the cocks with the haymakers. Egad, I am the most lucky son of a whore. I was wrapped in the tale of my mother's smock, landlady. Enter servant. Oh, but this lady, sir. Madam, here's a gentleman below wants to speak with you instantly. With me, child? Sir, I'll wait on you in a minute. Exit with servant. Re-enter club with wine and glasses. Is that the witty liquor? Oh, come, fill the glasses. Now that I have found my mistress, I must next find my wits. So you have need, master, for those that find a mistress are generally out of their wits. Gives him a glass. Come, fill for yourself. They jingle and drink. But where's the wit now, club? Have you found it? Egad, master, I think tis a very good jest. What? What? Why, drinking. 
you'll find master that this same gentleman in the straw doublet the same will o' the wisp is a wit at the bottom phils here here master how it puns and quibbles in the glass by the universe now i have it the wit lies in the jingling all wit consists most in jingling hear how the glasses rhyme to one another what master are these wits so apt to clash jingle the glasses oh by the universe by the universe this is wit breaks them my landlady is in the right i have often heard there was wit in breaking glasses it would be a very good joke to break the flask now i find then that this same wit is very brittle ware but i think sir twere no joke to spill the wine ay there suggests sarah all wit consists in losing there was never anything got by it i fancy the same wine is all sold at will's coffee-house do you know the way thither sirrah i long to see mr comic and mr tagrime with the rest of em i wonder how they look certainly these poets must have something extraordinary in their faces of all the rarities of the town i long to see nothing more than the poets in bedlam come in club i must go practise my honours tol dol de roll exit dancing and club toping scene three another room in the same enter lovewell and widow bullfinch oh mr lovewell you come just in the nick i was ready to spoil all by telling him that she was a stranger and just now come well my dear madam be cautious for the future tis the most fortunate chance that ever befell me twere convenient we had the other lodgers of our side there's nobody but mr lyric and you had to safely tell a secret over a groaning cheese as to him how so why you must know that he has been lying in these four months of a play and he has got all the muses about him a parcel of the most tattling gossips come come no more words but to our business i will certainly reward you but have you any good hopes of its succeeding very well of the squire's side but i'm afraid your widow would never play her part she's so awkward and so sullen go you and instruct her while i manage affairs abroad she's always raving of one roebuck prithee who is this same roebuck ah mr lovewell i'm afraid this widow of yours is something else at the bottom i'm afraid there has been a dog in the well Exit enter brush so sirrah where have you left the gentleman in a friend's house sir what friend why a tavern what took him there a coach sir how do you mean a coach and six sir no less i'll assure you sir a coach and six yes sir six whores and a carted board he picked em all up in the street and is gone with this splendid retinue into the sun by covent garden i asked him what he meant he told me that he only wanted to wet when the very sight of him turned my stomach the fellow will have his swing though he hang for it however run to him and bid him take the name of mock mode call himself mock mode upon all occasions and tell him that he shall find me here about four in the afternoon ask no questions but fly exit brush so his usurping that name gives him a title to court lucinda by which i shall discover her inclinations to this mock mode whose coming to town has certainly occasioned her quarrel with me while i set the hound himself upon a wrong scent and ten to one provide for mistress trudge by the bargain tis said one can't be a friend and a lover but opposite to that this plot shall prove i'll serve my friend by what assists my love Exit. End of Act Two. Act Three of Love in a Bottle by George Farquhar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One A Room in Lucinda's House. Enter Leanthe methinks this livery suits ill my birth but slave to love i must not disobey 
his service is the hardest vassalage forcing the powers divine to lay their godships down to be more gods more happy here below thus i poor wanderer have left my country disguised myself so much i hardly know whether this habit or my love be blindest to follow one perhaps that loves me not though every breath of his soft words was passion and every accent love o oh, roebuck <laughs> enter roebuck this is the page love's link boy that must light me the way oh no pretty boy has your lady beaten you ha huh. this lady must be a venus for she has got a cupid in her family tis a wondrous pretty boy leanthe starts and stares at him but a very comical boy what the devil did she stare at leanthe aside oh heavens is the object real or are my eyes false is that roebuck or am i leanthe i am afraid he is not the same and too sure i am not myself what offence could such pretty innocence commit to deserve a punishment to make you cry oh sir a wondrous offence what is it my child i pricked my finger with a pin till i made it bleed such little boys as you should have a care of sharp things indeed sir we ought for it pricked me so deep that the sore went to my very heart poor boy here's a plaster for your sore finger gives leanthe gold sir you had best kept it for a sore finger returns it oh my conscience the boy's witty but not very wise in returning gold come come you shall take it forces it upon her and kisses her that's the fitter cure for my sore finger <sighs> the same dear lips still oh that the tongue within them were as true by heavens this boy has the softest pair of lips i ever tasted i ne'er found before the ladies kissed their pages but now if this rogue were not too young i should suspect you beforehand with me egad i must kiss him again come you shall take the money kisses oh how he bribes me into bribery but what must i do with this money sir you must get a little mistress and treat her with it sir i have one mistress already and they say no man can serve two masters much less two mistresses how many mistresses have you pray um oh, egad the boy has posed me how many child why let me see there was mrs mary mrs margaret mrs lucy mrs susan mrs judy and so forth to the number of five and twenty or thereabouts oh ye powers and did you love them all yes desperately i would have drunk and fought for any one of them i have sworn and lied to every one of them and have lain with them all that's for your encouragement boy learn betimes youth young plants should be watered your smock face was made for a chamber utensil and did not one escape you yes one did to devil take her what don't you love her then no faith but he bear her an avarous grudge still something between love and spite he could kill her with kindness i don't believe it sir you could not be so hard-hearted sure her honourable passion i think should please you best oh child boys of your age are continually reading romances filling your heads with that old bombast of love and honour but when you come to my years you'll understand better things and must i be a false treacherous villain when i come to your years sir is falsehood and perjury essential to the perfect state of manhood pshaw children and old men always talk foolishly you understand nothing boy 
yes sir i've been in love and much more than you i perceive it appears ten that there's no service in the world so educating to a boy as a lady's by joe this spark may be older than i imagine harky sir do you never pull off your lady's shoes and stockings do you never reach for the pincushion do you never sit on her bedside and sing to her ha ah, come tell me that's my good boy makes much of her yes i do sing her asleep sometimes but do you never waken her again no but i constantly wake myself my rest's always disturbed by visions of the devil who would imagine now that this young shaver could dream of a woman so soon but what songs does your lady delight in most passionate ones sir i'll sing you one of them if you'll stay with all my heart my little cherubim the rogue is fond of showing his parts come begin how blessed are lovers in disguise like gods they see as i do thee unseen by human eyes exposed to view i'm hid from you i'm altered yet the same the dark conceals me love reveals me love which lights me by its flame were you not false you me would know for though your eyes could not devise your heart had told you so your heart would beat with eager heat and me by sympathy would find true love might see one change like me false love is only blind oh my little angel in voice and shape kisses her i could wish myself a female for thy sake leanthe aside you're much better as you are for my sake or if thou wert a woman i would what would you marry me would you marry me marry you child no no i love you too well for that you should not have my hand but all my body at once what to our business is your lady at home my lady what business have you with my lady pray sir don't ask questions you know mr lovewell yes very well he's my great friend and one i would serve above all the world but his sister his sister ha huh? that gives me a twinge for my sin pray mr page was leanthe well when you left her no sir but wondrous melancholy by the departure of a dear friend of hers to another world oh that was the person mentioned in her letter whose departure occasioned your departure for england that was the occasion of my coming too sure sir oh it was a dear friend to me the loss makes me weep poor tender-hearted creature but i still find there was not a word of me pray good boy let your mistress know here's one to wait on her your business is from mr lovewell i suppose sir yes yes then i'll go exit i've thrown my cast and i'm fairly in for it but aren't i an impudent dog had i as much gold in my breeches as brass in my face i durst attempt a whole nunnery this lady is a reputed virtue of good fortune and quality i am a rakily rascal not worth the groat and without any farther ceremony i'm going to debauch her but hold she does not know that i'm this rakily rascal and i know that she's a woman one of eighteen too beautiful witty oh my conscience upon second thoughts i am not so very impudent neither now as to my management i'll first try the whining addresses and see if she'll bleed in the soft vein enter lucinda 
Have you any business with me, sir? Thus looked a forbidden fruit, luscious and tempting. Tis ripe, and will soon fall, if one will shake the tree. Have you any business with me, sir? Comes nearer. Yes, madam, the business of mankind, to adore you. My love, like my blood, circulates through my veins, and at every pulse of my heart animates me with a fresh passion. Wonder not, madam, at the power of your eyes, whose painted darts have struck on a young and tender heart, which they easily pierced, and which, unaccustomed to such wounds, finds to smart more painful. The Anthe peeping in. O oh, traitor, just such words he spoke to me. Heyday, I was never so attacked in all my life. In love with me, sir. Did you ever see me before? Never, by Jove. Oh, ten thousand times, madam. Your lovely idea is always in my view, whether asleep or awake, eating or drinking, walking, sitting, or standing, alone or in company. My fancy wholly feeds upon your dear image, and every thought is you. Now have I told about fifteen lies in a breath. I suppose, sir, you are some conceited young scribbler, who has got the benefits of a first play in your pocket, and are now going a fortune hunting. But why a scribbler, madam? Are my clothes so coarse as if they were spun by those lazy spinsters, the muses? Does the party of my foretop show so thin, as if it resembled the two withered tops of Parnassus? Do you see anything peculiarly whimsical or ill-natured in my face? Is my countenance strained, as if my head were distorted by a strangury of thought? Is there anything proudly, slovenly, or affectedly careless in my dress? Do my hands look like paper moths? I think, madam, I have nothing poetical about me. Yes, sir. You have wit enough to talk like a fool, and are fool enough to talk like a wit. You call me poet, madam, and I know no better way of revenge than to convince you that I am won by my impudence. Offers to kiss her hand. Then make me a copy of verses upon that, sir. Hits him on the ear and exit. Re-enter Leanthe. How do you like the subject, sir? Tis a very copious one. Spitting. It has made my jaws rhyme in my head. This it is to be taught a poet. Every mince must be casting his profession in his teeth. What? Gone? Aye, she knows that making verses requires solitude and retirement. She certainly was afraid I intended to beg leave to dedicate something. If ever I make love like a poetical fool again, may I never receive any fever but a subject for a copy of verses. Re-enter Lucinda. I won't dismiss him thus, for fear he lampoon me. Well, sir, have you done them? Yes, madam, will you please to read? Catches her and kisses her three or four times. Oh, heaven, I can never bear it. I must devise some means to part them. Exit. Sir, your verses are too rough and constrained. However, because I gave the occasion, I'll pardon what's past. By the Lord, she was angry only because I did not make the first offer to her lips. Then, madam, the peace is concluded? Yes, and therefore both parties should draw out of the field. Going. Not till we make reprisals. I make peace with sword in hand, madam, until you return my heart, which you have taken, or your own in exchange, I will not put up. And so, madam, I proclaim open war again. Catches her. Re-enter Leanthe. Oh, madam! Yonder's poor little crab, your lapdog, has got his head between two of the window bars, and is like to be strangled. The dog howls behind the scenes. Oh, Lord, my poor crabby! I must run to the rescue of my poor dog. I'll wait on you instantly. Come, come, Paige. Poor crabby! Exit with Leanthe. Oh, the devil choke crabby! Will I find as much more rhetoric in the lips? than in the tongue. Had Bus been the first word of my courtship, I might have gained the outworks by this. 
Impudence in love is like courage in war. Though both blind chances, because women and fortune rule them. Re-enter Leanthe. Sir, my lady begs your pardon. There's something extraordinary happened, which prevents her waiting on you as she promised. What? Has Monsieur Crabby rubbed some of the hairs off his neck? Has he disordered his pretty ears? She won't come again, then? No, sir. You must excuse her. Then now go be drunk. Hacky, sirrah, we have half a dozen delicious creatures waiting for me at the sun. You shall along with me and have your choice. I'll enter you in the school of Venus, child. Tis time you had lost your maidenhead. You're too old for playthings. Oh, heavens! I had rather he should stay than go there. But why will you keep such company, sir? Nay, if you've her advice, farewell. Men of ripe understanding should always despise what babes only practice and dotards advise. Exit singing. Wild as winds and unconfined as air, yet I may reclaim him. His follies are weakly founded upon the principles of honour, where the very foundation helps to undermine the structure. How charming would virtue look in him, whose behaviour can add a grace to the unseemliness of vice. Re-enter Lucinda. What? Is the gentleman gone? Yes, madam. He was instantly taken ill with a violent pain in his stomach and was forced to hurry away in a chair to his lodging. Exit. Oh, poor gentleman! He's one of those conceited fools that think no female can resist their temptations. Blockheads that imagine all wit to consist in blaspheming heaven and women. I'll feed his vanity, but starve his love. And may all coxcombs meet no better fate, who doubt our sex's virtue, or dare prompt our hate. Exit. Scene two. A room in Widow Bullfinch's house. Lyric, discovered in a nightgown and cap, writing at a table on which papers are scattered about. Two as good lines as ever were written. Rising. Egad, I shall maul these topping fellows. Says Mr. Lee, let there be not one glimpse, one starry spark. But gods meet gods and jostle in the dark. Says little Lyric, let all the lights be burst out to a snuff, and gods meet gods and play at blind men's bluff. Very well. Let gods meet gods and so fall out and cuff. That's much mended. They're as noble lines as ever were penned. Oh, here comes my damned muse. I'm always in the humor of writing elegy after a little of her inspiration. Enter Widow Bullfinch. Mr. Lyric, what do you mean by all this? Here you have lodged two years in my house, promised me eighteen pence a week for your lodging, and I have never received eighteen farthings. Not the value of that, Mr. Lyric. Snaps with her fingers. You always put me off with telling me of your play. Your play. Sir, you shall play no more with me. I'm in earnest. This living on love is the dearest lodging. A man's eternally dunned. Though perhaps he have less of one ready coin than t'other. There's more trouble in a play than you imagine, madam. There's more trouble with a lodger than you think, Mr. Lyric. First, there's the decorum of time. Which you never observe, for you keep the worst hours of any lodger in town. Then there's the exactness of characters. And you have the most scandalous one I ever heard. Then there's the laying the drama. Then you foul my napkins and towels. Then there are preparations of incidents, working the passions, beauty of expressions, closeness of plot, justness of place, turn of language, opening the catastrophe. Then you wear out my sheets, 
burn my fire and candle, dirty my house, eat my meat, destroy my drink, wear out my furniture. I have lent you money out of my pocket. Was ever poor rogue so ridden? If ever the muses had a horse, I am he. Faith, madam, poor Pegasus is jaded. Come, come, sir. He shan't slip his neck out of the collar for all that. Money I will have, and money I must have. Let your play and you both be damned. Well, madam, my bookseller is to bring me some twenty guineas for a few sheets of mine presently, which I hope will free me from your sheets. My sheets, Mr. Lyric? Pray, what do you mean? I'll assure you, sir, my sheets are finer than any of your muses spinning. Mary, come up. Faith, you have spun me so fine that you have almost cracked my thread of life, as may appear by my spindle shanks. Why, sure. Where was your Talia and your Melpomene when the tailor would have stripped you of your silk waistcoat and have clopped you on a stone doublet? Would all your golden verse have paid the sergeant's fees? Truly, you freed me from jail to confine me in a dungeon. You did not ransom me, but bought me as a slave. So, madam, I'll purchase my freedom as soon as possible. Flesh and blood can't bear it. Take your course, sir. There were a couple of gentlemen just now to inquire for you. And if they come again, they shan't be put off with the old story of your being abroad. I'll promise you that, sir. Exit. Zunes, if this bookseller does not bring me money. Enter Pamphlet. Oh, Mr. Pamphlet, your servant. Have you perused my poems? Yes, sir, and there are some things very well, extraordinary well, Mr. Lyric. But I don't think I'm for my purpose. Poetry is a mere drug, sir. Is that because I take physic when I write? Damn this costive fellow! Now does he not apprehend the joke? No, sir, but your name does not recommend them. One must write himself into a consumption before he gains reputation. That's the way to lie abed when his name's up. Now I lie abed before I can gain reputation. Why so, sir? Because I have scarcely any clothes to put on. If ever man did penance in a white sheet. You stand only sometimes in a white sheet for your offences with your landlady. Faith, I have often wondered how your muse could take such flights, yoked to such a cartload as she is. Oh, they are like the Irish horses. They draw best by the tail. Have you ever seen any of my burlesque, Mr. Pamphlet? I have a project of turning three or four of our most topping fellows into doggerel. As, for example, Conquest with laurels has our arms adorned, and Rome in tears of blood our anger mourned. Now, butchers with rosemary have our beef adorned, which has in gravy tears our hunger mourned. How do you like it, Mr. Pamphlet, huh? Well, like gods we passed the rugged alpine hills, melted our way, and drove our hissing wheels through cloudy deluges, eternal rills. Now observe, Mr. Pamphlet, pray observe. Like razors keen, our knives cut passage clean, through rills of fat and deluges of lean. Very well, upon my soul. Hurled dreadful fire and vinegar infused. Ay, sir, vinegar. How patly that comes in for the beef, Mr. Lyric. Tis all wondrous fine indeed. This is the most ingenious fellow of his trade that I have seen. He understands a good thing. But as to our business, what are you willing to give for these poems? Prithee say something. There are about three thousand lines. Here, take em for a couple of guineas. No, sir. Paper is so excessive dear that I dare not venture upon him. Well, because you're a friend, I'll bestow em upon you. Here, take em all. 
there's the hopes of a dedication still i give you a thousand thanks sir but i dare not venture the hazard they'll never quit cost indeed sir this fellow is one of the greatest blockheads that ever was a member of a corporation how shall i be revenged enter boy sir there are two men below desire to have the honour of kissing your hand they must be knaves or fools by their fulsome compliment hark ye whispers boy bid em walk up since you have got company sir i'll take my leave no no mr pamphlet by no means we must drink before we part boy a pint of sack and a toast exit boy these are two gentlemen out of the country who will be for all the new things lately published they'll be good customers come sit down you have not seen my play yet here take the pen and if you see anything amiss correct it i'll go bring em up stay lend me your hat and wig or i shall take cold going downstairs takes pamphlet's hat and wig and puts his cap on pamphlet's head and exit this is a right poetical cap tis bays the outside and the lining fustian reading mm, this is all stuff worse than his poems enter two bailiffs behind and clap him on the shoulder sir you're the king's prisoner that's a good fancy enough mr lyric but pray don't interrupt me i'm in the best scene egad the drama is very well laid come sir well well sir i'll pledge ye prithee now good mr lyric don't disturb me and furious lightnings brandished in her eyes that's true spirit of poetry zoon sir do you banter us takes him under each arm and hauls him up gentlemen i beg your pardon how do you like the city gentlemen if you have any occasion for books to carry into the country i can furnish you as well as many men about poles where's mr lyric these wits are damnable cunning i always have double fees for arresting one of you wits all your evasions won't do we understand traps sir you must not think to catch old birds with shafts sir zounds gentlemen i'm not the person i'm a freeman of the city i have good effects gentlemen good effects do you think to make a fool of me i'm a bookseller no poet ay uh, sir we know what you are by your fool's cap there yes one of you wits would have passed upon us for a corn cutter yesterday and was so like one we had almost believed him hauls him why gentlemen gentlemen officers have a little patience and mr lyric will come upstairs no no mr lyric shall go downstairs he would have us wait till some friends come in to rescue him ah these wits are devilish cunning exeunt bailiffs hauling pamphlet re-enter lyric with mock mode and club ha 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 very poetical faith a good plot for a play mr mock mode a bookseller bound in calves leather ha 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 how they walked along like the three volumes of the english rogue squeezed together on a shelf what was it what was it mr lyric why i am a statesman sir i can't but laugh to think how they'll sponge the sheet before the errata be blotted out then how will he hamper the dogs for false imprisonment but pray what's the matter mr lyric nothing sir but a shirking bookseller that owed me about forty guineas for a few lines he would have put me off so i sent for a couple of bulldogs and arrested him oh lord mr lyric honesty is quite out of doors tis a rare thing to find a man that's a true friend a true friend is a rare thing indeed mr lyric will you be my friend i only want that accomplishment i have got a mistress a dancing and fencing master and now i want only a friend to be a fine gentleman have you never had a friend sir yes a very honest fellow our friendship commenced in the college cellar and we loved one another like two brothers 
still we unluckily fell out afterwards at a game at tables i find then that neither of ye lost by the set but my short acquaintance can't recommend me to such a trust pshaw acquaintance you must be a man of honour as you're a poet sir but what use would you make of a friend sir only to tell my secrets to and be my second now sir a wit must be best to keep a secret because what you say to one's prejudice will be thought malice then you must have a devilish deal of courage by your heroic writing but know that i alone am king of me heavens sure the author of that line must be a plaguy stout fellow it makes me valiant as hector when i read it sir we stick to what we write as little as divines to what they preach besides sir there are other qualifications requisite in a friend he must lend you money now sir i can't be that friend for i want forty guineas sir i can lend you fifty upon good security twas the last word my father spoke on his deathbed that i should never lend money without security fie sir security from a friend and a man of honour by his profession too by the universe that's true you are my friend then i'll tell you a secret they whisper now will this plaguy wit turn my nose out of joint i was my master's friend before though i never found the knack of borrowing money though i have received some marks of his friendship some sound drubs about the head and shoulders or so i have been bound to him too in the stocks for his breaking windows very often mr mockmode you may be imposed upon i would see this lady you court i know mr lovewell has a mistress named lucinda but that she lodges in this house i much doubt imposed upon well, that's very comical <laughs> you shall see sir come pray sir you're my friend nay pray indeed sir i beg your they compliment for the door pardon you're a squire sir zound sir you lie i'm not a fool i'll take an affront from no man draw sir draws draw sir egad i'll put his nose out of joint now unequal numbers gentlemen i'm only my master's friend his second or so sir what's the matter noble squire you lie again sir zounds draw strikes him with his sword ha a blow essex a blow yet i will be calm zounds draw sir strikes him oh patience heaven thou art my friend still you lie sir then thou art a traitor tyrant monster zounds sir you're a son of a whore and a rascal a scribbler ah ah that stings home scribbler ay scribbler ballad maker nay then i and the gods will fight it with ye all draws enter roebuck drunk and singing france will ne'er comply till her claret run dry then let's pull away to defeat her he hinders the peace who refuses his glass and deserves to be hanged for a traitor <coughs> so my myrmidons fall on i have taken off the odds dub a dub dub a dub to the battle Sons, gentlemen why don't ye fight blood fight oblige me to fight a little he longed to see a little sport sir i scorn to show sport to any man puts up and so do i by the universe and i by the universe i shall take another time exit here rascal take your chubby knife gives club his sword and bring me a joint of that coward's flesh for your master's supper fly dog takes him by the nose oh this fellow's likeliest to put my nose out of joint exit now sir tell me how you durst be a coward coward sir i'm a man of great estate sir 
i have five thousand acres of as good fighting ground as any in england good terra firma sir cowards sir. have a care what you say sir my father was a parliament man sir and i was bred at the college sir oh then i know your genealogy your father was a senior fellow and your mother was an air pump you were suckled by platonic ideas and you have some of your mother's milk in your nose yet form the proposition by mode and figure sir i told you so blow your nose child and have a care of dirting your philosophical slabbering bib what do you mean sir your stanch band set by mode and figure sir band sir this fellow's blind drunk i wear a cravat sir then set a good face upon the matter throw off childishness and folly with your hanging sleeves now you have left the university learn learn this fellow is an atheist by the universe i'll take notice of him and inform against him for being drunk pray sir what's your name my name by the lord i <laughs> forgot <coughs> stay i shall think on't by and by zounds forget your own name your memory must be very short sir Ay, so it seems for i was but christened this morning and i forgot it already was your worship then turk or jew before i knew he was some damned blooded dog sir i have been turk or jew rather since for i have got a plaguy heathenish name pox on't oh no i have it Mo mock 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 mode mock mode M mock mode sir pray how do you spell it go you to your e b c you came last from the university sir i'm called mock mode what family are you of sir what family are you of sir of mock mode hall in shropshire the name of the sea i believe i fancy sir that you and i are near relations the relations sir there are about two families my father's who is now dead and his brother's colonel peaceable mockmode ay ay the very same colonel peaceable is he not colonel of militia yes sir and was he not high sheriff of the county last year the very same sir the very same i'm a dead family and your father died about let me see about half a year ago exactly by the same token you got drunk at a hunting match that very day seven night he was buried this fellow's a witch but it looks very strange that you should be christened this morning i'm sure your godfather's had a plaguy deal to answer for oh sir i'm of age to answer for myself one would not think so you're so forgetful tis two and twenty years since i was christened and i can remember my name still come we'll take a glass of wine and that will clear our understanding we'll remember our friends you must excuse me sir this is some sharper nay prithee cousin good cousin mochmode one glass i know you are an honest fellow we must remember our relations in the country indeed sir oh sir you're so short of memory you can never call em to mind you have forgot yourself sir mockmode is a heathenish name sir and all that sir and so i beg your pardon sir exit now were i lawyer enough by the little inquiry into that fellow's concerns i could bring in a full steed to cheat him of his estate enter brush where the devil is thy master you said i should find him here tis impossible for you or me or anybody to find him why because he has lost himself the devil has made a juggler's ball of him i believe he's here now then presto pass in an instant he has got some damn business to-day in hand ay so it seems i must be square mock mode and caught an honourable mistress into devil's name well let my sober thinking friend plot on and lay traps to catch futurity i'm for holding fast the present i have got about twenty guineas in my pocket and whilst they last 
the devil take George if he thinks of futurity. I'll go hand in hand with fortune. She is an honest, giddy, reeling punk, my head, her wheel, turn around, and so we both are drunk. Exit reeling, brush following. End of Act Three.